everybody. This is Cody Bateman. Welcome to a episode of our latest marketing cast. I've been waiting a long time for this one. My goodness, I've been waiting a long time. I got the king of sales on with us today. King of sales. We're going to jump into who that is just a minute. A lot of you probably already know who that is, but uh, we'll jump into that in just a second. King of sales on with us today. Who's who of the sales industry, VIP in the house. We're super excited to have this guy with us today. Uh, before we jump in, uh, again, just want to reach out to all of our listeners and thank you for participating, being part of this, sharpening your saw, learning more about the concept of relationship marketing and how you can implement it into your sales channels and implement it into your businesses. Uh, it's essential today. It's absolutely essential today that you learn it, it you implement it, teach it, and be a part of it. So. Relationship marketing, it's what it's all about. I have the book, Power of Human Connection, how relationship marketing is transforming the way people succeed. We also have the Marketing Grand Summit coming up on August 8th and 9th, Salt Lake City, Utah. If you don't know about that, go to uh, Relationship Marketing Grand Summit. Um, I think that stands, let's see, what is that? RMGS, rmgs.com. Go check that out. See the, the, feature set, uh, the feature speakers that will be there. Uh, incredible thing that we got coming up. All right, let's jump right in. The king of cells, the one and only Mr. Jeffrey Gittimer. Jeffrey, how are you, my friend? Let's bring Hey, I'm doing fine. How are you? Look at this studio he has. All of you watching us on YouTube, we got the old Jeffrey. He's he's not only the king of cells, he's the king of podcasts. He's the king of pretty much everything he does. So, but you know, he's got this super cool looking uh, studio where you do all your podcast stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I'll start out by inviting myself to be a guest on your podcast. I hey, you're that. totally welcome. Uh, I'll I'll prepare an amazing interview that will uh, uh, put all over the internet. We're we're very good. Podcasting is one thing. Promoting the guest That's is right. another thing. That's right. That's right. That, that we'll, promote how, we'll give you graphics. We'll we'll give you a put hair on you. We'll do anything you need to be able to. Uh, get a few more listeners to your things. Um, but one of the reasons that I'm excited about this is that uh, I've always admired send out cards for what they were. I probably have received more candy and brownies than I could probably shake a, than I could shake a stick at. But more important, and this is, I'd say, unknown to your listeners, I grew up in relationship marketing, direct selling, back when it was called multi-level marketing. It's had five or six names over the years. Uh, the MLM was probably the, the biggest one at the time. But in 1972, it's where I learned how to sell. It's where I got my positive attitude. It's where I, I little at my teeth when enough, I had the gab, but I never understood the science of selling. I would never have got it were it not for direct selling. Yeah, well, that's that's interesting. In fact, uh, I'm glad that you got it. I remember walking into a bookstore. Good crime. I mean, it was maybe 2005, 2004, or something like that in that area. And I saw this cool book. It kind of jumped off the shelf at me, Little Red Book of Selling. Uh, it was at, I think it was in an, at uh, Barnes & Noble or one of those kind of stores. I didn't know you back then, didn't have any clue who you were, but I do remember picking up and reading that book way back then and been a fan of yours ever since. I mean, uh, Little Red Book is selling, good heck. Hasn't that sold? How many copies has that sold? It is at the moment the largest selling sales book of all time. Uh, it's in the millions of what it has sold. And uh, you can record that it's over a million in America. But you never know what it is because they cheat right. on your – on royalties, but we we can track about five million. Five million um, copies of this. Yeah, supply. it probably means double when yeah. you get to China and Russia and India and all the places that just literally rip you off. Prior uh, to that, you had the Sales Bible, so the Sales yeah. Bible was like the first one, right? Mm -hmm. Sales Bible was my first book, and it's still in print twenty five years later. Wow, that's fantastic! And yeah, it's amazing to me, I, literally. Yeah. Since the beginning, 15 books, I think about 15 books yep. that you've got on the market. And I'm uh, really anxious to talk to you a little bit today about some of your latest work, the Napoleon Hill Foundation stuff. I'm mm -hmm. very, that huge fan of Napoleon Hill. 
So we'll jump into that. Let's, let's, let's talk, man. Let's, let's have a conversation. Again, I remember grabbing that book, Little Red Book of Selling. I don't know if you remember, Jeff, but I actually had a, a phone conversation with you way back in the day, maybe 2007, something like that. When uh, you first started? When I was getting first started and the business yeah. was getting off the ground and you and I had a conversation, somebody else was on the call. It was a great honor to talk to you back then because again, I was, I was a, nobody introduced me to you. I met you through the bookstore. So, you know, <laughs> that was, cool. it was kind of a cool thing for me, but. That makes me happy. Yeah. Yeah. It's good stuff. So you're, you're a pretty colorful guy. I mean, I got all this stuff I could read, but everybody knows, you know, you. Yeah, I'm very colorful. I, I have to admit, I'm a Yankee, you know, I'm a New Yorker, Philadelphian. Um, I cut my teeth cold calling in Manhattan where up yours is a greeting and everybody wants a bribe. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to start by getting you good and charged oh. up. Let's, let's get you charged up. So today in the marketplace today with the, with social media, YouTube, all of these ways that people can get their messaging out. Mm -hmm. We, we have this thing that, that I like to call guru itis. There's guruitis going on out there. There's just a, there's just got to be a million sales trainers now, a million self-proclaimed gurus, influencers. Uh, just ask them; they'll tell you, you know how 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 great. And there, and I don't mean any disrespect to anybody, but I'm really challenged by this. I mean, I'm an avid student of personal development, of sales, of marketing. I, I, I love to read good stuff, good content. Uh, your, your content's been phenomenal over the years. Good criminy, brother. How do you get through all the clutter today? There's so much out there. How do you get through uh, I a million five-step things out there today? What do, I, you, what do you do? I start my morning out the same way for 25 years. I wake up in the morning and I write, read, prepare, and that causes me to think and create. I've done that for 25 years. I don't have writer's block because I don't write to write. I write like I talk. And you don't, you never get talker's block. I mean, you never call me on the phone and go, hey, Jeffrey, it's really nice to talk to you, but I can't really think of anything to say right now. <laughs> and so I, I write like I talk, and that has always allowed me to be prolific. And I don't expose myself to many things that are new unless I respect the person. And so all of the other uh, noise in the marketplace, I would say bullshit, but I don't know if you have a G-rated show or not. Um, I have a feeling it's not going to matter if I have a G-rated <laughs> It's true, but <laughs> this was I possibly can. Okay. Uh, but, but I think it's important to understand that you don't become an expert overnight you become an expert after 20 years of busting hump and writing and succeeding and failing and, you know, making it happen. Your whiskers have to be gray in order to be really respected when you're listened to. I don't, I can't listen to the guy who's standing in front of a Lamborghini. I don't, I don't want that guy. Yeah. Uh, if you're standing in front of a jet airplane, way to go. You've, you've done it. I respect that part, but don't tell me I can do it. If you can do it, that is the worst strategy for success that I've ever heard of. What you're saying is, I did it, therefore it can be done. But right. don't think just because I did it that you did it, because we have different backgrounds. We, we started out different. Our parents were different. Our growing up neighborhood was different. Our work ethic is different. Our study is different. And you can't do it for the money. You have to and you can make it. I love sales. That's why I'm oh. great at it. Uh, literally, I wake up in the morning and I can't wait to sell or, or talk to somebody about creating a process where they will buy, which is more important. I, I write about buying motives rather than selling skills. But the, in my soul, I love it. Yeah, you can tell. You can tell that you love it. I mean, you have a, you're very passionate. Remember, I ran into you at the Outbound Conference and just yeah. you know, within, you know, geez, within 60 seconds of chatting with you, I could just feel your energy and your passion for and vice versa, vice versa. I, that's very important. But I think um, more important than that is the fact that you work at it every day in spite of your, you don't feel good, you don't, you know, you're, you're sick today, whatever the circumstances, you, you freaking get up and do it. 
no matter if you, I, I, I tell people to end your goals with even if your ass falls off. <laughs> that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make three sales on Monday, even if my ass falls off. Yeah, that's and that way it's a much more, you know, there's, there, there's intensity about it. There's compassion about it. There's, there's, I, I think you have to have that ability to engage people in a way that is emotional rather than logical in order to be able to make the sale happen. One of the things you talked about just a second ago, you know, the whole list, uh, you need experience. And part of your list of experience, you mentioned failure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all these new self-proclaimed gurus talk about their successes and, and show the airplanes and all that kind of stuff. And oftentimes we don't see transparency. We don't see the failure side of things. Talk to us about some of your failure. I mean, you're one of the most successful I mean, that, I, would say, I would say this. My father taught me, uh, he said, son, you can't really succeed in business or in life until you failed a couple of times. So you learned and, that early on. You learned early yeah, on. Totally. You know, totally. But I, I learned attitude. Yeah. So when I failed the second time, I, I looked at the mirror. I go, great, I'm ready. Yeah, nice. Rather than, oh, shit, I did that again. I, you know, I'm not going to amount to anything. Uh, these people don't understand me. I'm, I'm never, if it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have no luck. No. If you have attitude, you can fail. If you don't have attitude, you, you're not, you're not going to fail the right way. You're going to fail and be grumbling about it and be bitter about it. And, you know, um, yeah. one of my mentors is, uh, uh, Glenn Turner from dare to be great. And he got out of, he got, he spent four and a half years in jail, uh, when they were really persecuting multi-level marketing people. And the first thing he said in, a, in the first interview, when he, he got out, spent four and a half years, he says, I'm better, wow, not bitter. That's something. And that's how you have to be. Yeah, that's right. That's how you have to be. If you, can, if you can spend that much of your life in a hole and come out and your attitude is still fine, dude, you got an attitude. You, you, yeah, that's, that's good. So early on, you had some failures, then you had a lot of successes. Uh, did, you, did you have failures along the way? Have you had recent failures in your Well, career? look at it this way. When I went to publish my first book, The Sales Bible, I went to New York City where I'd cold called for years. I had 14 publishers that I went to see, and 13 of them turned me down. Now, you had 13 turndowns, but I got one acceptance, which is really all you need. That's right. You know, you get, was it a good one? I have no idea if it was a good one. It was one. Right. And in the, in the leg of, of publishing, you, I wanted to have my book in the bookstore. You know, I wanted my dad to see that my book was in the bookstore and, you know, pop, go to, go to Bunch of Noble. You can find my book. Yeah. And that's, it's a start. You have to be happy with your start. Yeah. You can't, you can't look at it as, you can't measure it. If you try to measure it, you're going to lose. And, and I, have, I was taught at home, you don't measure anything. You just give it away and you figure out how to, you know, to, the world will pay you back. My, I was taught early on, you don't lend money to people. You just give it. And that uh, way, if they don't pay you back, you're not pissed off. Yeah, you know, that's good. My dad taught me that. My dad taught me that. That's what I've always done. Yeah, I don't lend you money. I'll give it to you. I ain't going to lend it to you. So, exactly. Yeah. And, and you look at yourself and you're in a situation where, you have the opportunity to be anything, to do anything that you want, and you decide. Early on in, in, in our attitude training, uh, I heard in a, in a seminar that, that you're given a bucket of water and a bag of cement, and you either make a stepping stone or a stumbling block out of it. It is 100% your choice. Wow. And that stuck with me forever, yeah. literally forever. Uh, I, I think that the, the early lessons that you get, if, you, if you're paying attention, if you're taking notes, you know, you go to a seminar, I see people texting and like, what are you doing that for? Like you're there for a couple of hours, you might learn something. So pay attention. If you go to a seminar, pay attention. Yeah. Listen with the intent to understand. And not like I know that, but rather how good am I at that? Yeah. Like everybody knows they need a great voicemail, but I guarantee you, Every single person listening to this podcast right now, your voicemail sucks. How about that? <laughs> and, and so 
it's a, it's not a matter of I know that. It's a matter of how good are you at it. Right. And you have to ask yourself that on a daily basis. Yeah. Because the closer you get to the city, the more people know everything. Right. Right. I, so, I, so let me let me just go through this a little sure. real quick. You you uh, released the Sales Bible in 1994. Yep. Uh, you released the Little Red Book of Selling in 2004. Correct. I love how you're subheading 12.5 principles of sales greatness. I don't know you ha how you have half of a principle, but that but that's what you do. You always do little things hey, to really exactly. make people think. You know, I, I get part of your strategy. Exactly. I, why would my list be like everybody else's list? Right. Which is good. I mean, the uniqueness of that and that kind of stuff. I trademarked it, Cody. Yeah, that's good. So you, 1994, big release, 2004, big release, 13 additional books uh, in between and, and up to the present day. Uh, one of your latest books is right in front of you. We're going to get yep. to that in a second. We'll get to that in a minute. But what I, before we do that, I want, I want to kind of walk through this because you've been, been you, you've, you've, you have been, a been there, done that guy for a and lot got the t -shirt. of years. So got the t-shirt yeah. to prove it. So You've seen a lot of change in the sales oh, yeah. world. You've seen oh, a yeah. amount of change. So I want, I, I'd like you to speak to that. Speak to the enormous change. You know, the principles that you taught in the sales Bible, do they apply today? And uh, what new principles do you need to add to the ones you had back in 1994? The foundational principles will never change. You either have an attitude of positive or you don't. Um, and I, I wrote the book, The Little Gold Book of Yes Attitude. It sold 300,000 copies, and I trademarked Yes Attitude. And it's because it, it's one level higher than positive attitude. I want to go yes, not positive. And um, those foundational principles will never change. However, the social world has forever changed the sales world. And the salesperson who is not socially relevant will soon become irrelevant because as you're walking into a sales call, I'm going to go, I'm going to Google you. Right. That's right. And in two minutes, I'm going to look you up on Twitter. I'm going to look you up on LinkedIn. I'm going to look you up and see if you got a website or a blog or a podcast, or uh, do you do live Facebook videos? What, what do you do to build your own reputation so that when you walk in to a, to a, a meeting, I want to do business with a somebody, not a nobody. And in the old days of selling, you could fake it. You can no longer fake it. Yeah, interesting. And the, the car, you know, look at the people's jobs that have changed as a result of the internet. Look at the insurance sales guy. Look at the stock broker. All of those jobs have changed literally forever with the advent of online. Now, there'll always be a place for sales, but only the best guys are going to stay. Only the best guys are going to overcome artificial intelligence. Only the best guys are going to overcome Amazon. Only the best guys are going to become the buy, the buy now button. I mean, can you imagine what's going to happen when General Motors puts the buy now button on Chevrolet? Right, right, right. Yeah, what happens to all the dealerships and all the... <laughs> the, the cigarette smoking, coffee drinking car salesperson of yesteryear is over. It'll be delivered by an 18-year-old computer literate kid that can show you where the battery is because there's not going to be an engine anymore. You know, it's interesting. I recently bought a new truck a couple years ago, uh, about a year ago. I was just a year ago. I bought a new truck, went to this big, big dealership, and I, and I walked in, and I look over to the right side, and there's, there is there 35 young people sitting in these, these cubby uh, holes, these little cubby holes. Yeah. And they're just going crazy. They got stuff, you know, they got a thing on their head and they're talking on the phone and they're going crazy on the deal. And I'm like, what are all those guys doing? And he says, Oh, those are our internet sales guys. And they're, and they're just, and they outsell everybody here. So they had 35 people in a corner over there selling online cars off of that lot. So yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's just amazing. The car business will evolve because it is a big ticket item. It is the second biggest item beside your house that, you, that a consumer will buy. And there's companies like CarMax and Carvana where you get it out of a, a vending machine. 
Uh, my daughter bought a Carvana car, car. They went to this big, tall building. The car's in a window. They hit the button. The car comes down in an elevator. You, you get the key and you take it for a drive. I, it was unbelievable. They didn't talk to anybody. They didn't talk to anybody. And here's the price. Either you want to pay the price or you don't. There's no haggle. There's no bullshit. There's no, you know, there's no, it, it, those days are over. And for anybody listening, if you want to see how stupid the car business used to be and pretty much still is in some places, go and look for um, the Johnson Motor Company in, in Raleigh where they have the, uh, uh, the sales badger. And they have this cartoon character of a, a badger and that he's the sales guy and it's they're funny they're literally they're funny as hell because they're true yeah and come on i got a lot of i've got a lot of customers waiting you know and there's a there's a woman waiting she's looking at an suv and uh and the car the car badger guy goes out there and goes uh your husband gets here we can talk all about it <laughs> right right and that's the old way. The old way of selling is is dead. The fundamentals are alive, but the strategies that they use to to capture the sale are done. Okay, so let's talk about that. How did you you said you know the the uh, you know the 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 exceptional people will rise up to the top. Yep. How do you so how do you be one of those people in this ever changing marketplace as fast as it's changing? How does you have the people that could be you have the people that could be your customers be in the marketplace where they can read about you or learn about you or read what you write and become attracted to you it's not a matter of the law of attraction it's value attraction because the ceo doesn't want to learn about jeffrey gittimer they want to learn about profit mm -hmm. they want to learn about, they want to learn about employee law loyalty. They want to learn about productivity. They want to learn about making more sales. And if I write about those topics, someone will find me. And when they find me, they call me. So at my, my track record for the last 25 years is I've done 2,500 seminars, never made a sales call. The only reason you didn't hire me to do your thing on August 8th is because I didn't call you. Right. Next year, you'll call me. Oh yeah, no doubt about it. I'm wait. I'm waiting for that phone call. We actually didn't think you were approachable at the time. You know, you're you're the king of sales, man. So, I'm pretty approachable. I pee like <laughs> I'm te teasing. I'm kind of teasing. If we go to the men's room, we pee right next to each right, other. Right. <laughs> well, we hey, we'd love to have you. We'd love to have you anytime. Cool. I mean, it's amazing. But but the, this is a challenge, Cody. The person who's presenting has to have information that is genuine that is transferable to the audience, which means the audience has to say, I, I, I like it, I agree with it, I think I can do it, I'm willing to try it. Those elements make the message transferable. And it has to be told with some kind of emotion, not with braggy or logic. There has to be an emotional outlet for it. And so I, you know, I, have created this process of emotional transference that it literally it works that okay. the sale is made it's made emotionally then justified logically okay so if you're in sales you need to be on twitter you need to be on facebook you yep you need to be relevant you need to be searchable and findable and viable so how much time like if you're if uh consulting you do a lot of or have mm -hmm. done a lot of over the years you're consulting a sales team how much time would you tell them to spend on their social media activity versus actual selling an hour a day so so it's just it's it's not a lot but it has to be consistent right yeah you got to do it every day and you do it either in the morning when you wake up or in the evening before you go to bed not during the day i mean you might be able to devote 15 minutes to it with somebody hits you up, you know, uh, uh, socially, but I don't get any notifications. So do you do that? Do you spend an hour a day doing that? Um, I'll spend about a half an hour a day doing it, but I got, I have a guy in, in, in my office that, that will do social for me, but only what I say and what I've written. Okay. So, uh, 
when you say do it, I mean, I'm assuming they'll post on LinkedIn. They'll take a quote out of one of my books and, and quote it. But then I get re response and I think them, you know, I'm actively involving in the communication. Yeah, so part of it is you're, you're commenting, you're commenting on others' comments, you're liking, yes. you're sharing, you're doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't do a lot of comment because I'd piss people off if I did. So <laughs> I try to be as nice as I can and just say thank you. Right. You know what I mean? I, I, you know, you're the greatest. Oh, thank you. And done. Right. I, I don't want to say, well, here's a link you can use to buy my stuff. I don't do that. If people want to buy my stuff, they'll buy my stuff. Well, a lot of what we're talking about is probably in that book right in front of you. The it is. But totally. I've taken the best stuff that's happened in the last 25 years and put it all in this book. Hey, and, tell about this book. Well, he, he, I'll tell you about the opening line. If you're a vegetarian, this book is not for you. This book is all meat. <laughs> That's good. That's good. And I say the manifesto sale is not find the pain. It's find the pleasure, make sale, and build the relationship. Excellent. And Excellent. so I look at it from the perspective of I don't, I'm not looking to manipulate somebody. I'm looking to make a friend. All things being equal, people want to do business with their friends. All things being not quite so equal, people still want to do business with their friends. And well, people you know, still they can trust for sure. Of course, I want to like them, I want to believe them, I want to have confidence in them, and I want to trust them. If those four things are element, uh, are, if those four elements are present, I'm going to possibly make a sale. But here's the unknown part. People think that you have to have trust. No, no, no. I have to like you. If I don't like you, I'm never going to trust you. That's right. Ever. You know, I mean, can you imagine a, a young girl coming back from a date and going, you know, I really trusted that guy, but I didn't like him. No, it's not going to happen. So people don't understand that likability is one of the prime elements of becoming a great salesperson. Right. Oh, I like that guy. And humor is huge. If you don't have humor, I, chapter eight in the Little Red Book of Selling, if you can make them laugh, you can make them buy. And I've, I have always employed humor as, as the biggest element in, or the element of surprise or the element of creativity plays very heavily into what I do. Very, very heavily. All right, Gittimer, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send you a $100 bill if you can make me laugh in the next 10 seconds. Go ahead. Somebody, somebody record it. You got 10 seconds. You got to make I lost my mother when I was two and a half years old. I found her an hour later. I got off the bus. She got lost. I... My mother didn't die till I was 43, but you thought I lost my mother when I was two and a half because of one word I said, lost. Yeah. Well, that was weird because I was looking for a laughter emotion and you started with that and I went, whoa. Oh, exactly. And you pulled me back. Yeah, that was good. That's the line I gave to the National Speakers Association when I gave my speech to 1,600 other speakers who all have in their, you know, they fingers came off when they climb Mount Everest so they're in a wheelchair or something. And I, I grew up in a family that was pretty much upper middle class. I played golf on the weekends with my dad. Um, you yeah, know, we didn't want for anything. And so I thought I would start out with something. And these people in the audience were howling when I, when I delivered that line. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. It, it, here's it. It's a matter of this, Cody. It's a matter of can you connect? Can you engage the other person in a way that's emotional and real? If you can engage them emotionally and in a real way, you're going to win. And if you cannot, you're going to push them away. What's the best way to connect? I mean, what do you like? You know, you're out in the sales deal. You're going through the sales channel or sales uh, your your own sales mm -hmm. process. What is the best way to connect? Asking questions and trying to create avenues of common ground. What's more important, building a relationship or getting a sell? Building a relationship. Okay, now. That seems like an easy question to answer and everybody answers it the same and everybody listening right now would probably have said, Oh, well, yeah, building a relationship, but yet so many salespeople, some of them are listening. They'll say build the relationship, but then they'll go out and try to close. the sale. Sale. Yeah. Okay. So this is what I recommend. Like I'm, I try to meet people early in the morning. I have a seven o'clock breakfast tomorrow morning. I'm taking my daughter to summer camp at eight o'clock, but I have a seven o'clock breakfast with money. And this person can give me money tomorrow morning and I'm going to get it. 
No matter if my ass falls off, I'm going to get it. But I'm going to ask them questions unrelated to selling. So if we sit down on, in a conversation in the morning, have a cup of coffee, I'm going to say, Cody, um, where did you grow up? Are you asking me that? Yeah, I am asking. Where did you grow up? I grew up in a little place, Taylorsville, Utah. And the near Salt Lake City, far near away? Salt Lake City, near Salt Lake City, yeah. How many people in the city? Well, a million people in the, on the Wasatch Front, my little town, probably 5,000 people. Right. Um, and did you lock your house? No. So I lived in Bean Blossom, Indiana for four years, uh, just south of Indianapolis. There were 125 people in, in Bean Blossom. Never locked my house, never took my keys out of the car. Four years. Wow. You can't do that in Philly. <laughs> you can't even do it in Salt Lake. No, you can't. No, you can't. But we are already established some kind of common ground in that short minute yep. that says we were trusting people back then. And we may be a little bit more on, on guard right now. And so I'm looking to be able to understand the people who grew up in a small town will trust more than people who grew up in a big city. Like I had no locks on my door in, in Indiana, but Philly, we had 14 locks on the door and that was just for relatives. <laughs> you got it? Yeah, I got it. That's good. So, okay. So I want to make sure that I can engage the other person in a way where we find something in common. And if I can find something in common, I can get to the next thing in common. Then I can get to the next thing in common because we haven't talked about children yet or grandchildren yet. And, um, you know, if you, if you have kids, we have something in common. If you've traveled, we have something in common. If you have given a speech, we have something in common. I'm going to find out what we do have in common and focus on that. That's good. Now, even, even that, you know, I've noticed a lot of people in their sales approach. It's like most people today have this, have what you said, you know, build rapport, find common ground, you know, ask lots of questions, do these things. I mean, pretty much everybody's saying that, but one of the things I've noticed out there, you know, as we teach our relationship marketing courses is, is a lot of people, they, they get that, but they kind of, they're kind of scripted with it. They're kind of scripted with that kind of stuff. And what I find is we really have to teach people a lot, the importance of genuine human connection. Like Correct. you're not there to follow a script Right. You're there to make a genuine connection with another human being. I'm a human. That person's a human. You're trying to make a connection. You're not worried about anything you're going to gain out of it. It's make a connection. And I agree a thousand percent. I just want to have a conversation with people. Right. Even when I give a talk, I'm, I, the first thing I do is get off the platform and walk out in the audience. And I'll take risks, for example. I start one of the one of the stories that I'll start a speech with is I was flying into Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. The plane was three hours late and it's raining. And I get out of the plane and I had to walk out onto the tarmac. And the first thing that happens when it's raining is my hair gets all ruined. And I'll look at a bald guy like me and I'll go, you know what I mean? <laughs> and he goes, yeah. And now the whole audience is totally engaged because me and the bald guy have built rapport. Right immediately I have their attention. I get their attention through humor and that's it. And I try to do it in the first minute of my talk. I'll play a rock and roll song and I'll walk out on the stage and I'll say, you know, if I play music, I can take you back to an exact place in time. If I play the right song, I can take you back to your first date. If I play the right song, I can take you back to your first kiss. If I play the right song, I can take you to your first wife. <laughs> and, and the audience is howling. And I'll get comments shouted out and all kinds of stuff. And it is the engagement, the genuine engagement, or you lose. Yeah. Well, that's what relationship marketing is all about. That's what right. we, the importance of having that throughout your uh, sales process, throughout your, your business process, throughout your life. You know, just, just Not only that, Cody, but... It's asking engaging questions. Yeah. See, when I ask, where did you grow up? And you told me about that little town in Utah. You couldn't help but think about 
the house you grew up in. Oh, no doubt. Your no siblings, doubt. all the all the things that happened to you during that period of time. I created an emotional connection with you that you weren't thinking about when we first started this conversation. Well, I'll tell you what's interesting about that is just this morning, and you call this coincidence or whatever, but just this morning I was uh, scrolling Facebook and there was an invitation on there for me to join a Facebook group of my uh, Taylor's, uh, Taylorsville neighborhood growing up. And there, were si there were already 66 members of this private Facebook group cool. of all my friends growing up in the neighborhood. I saw that just this morning. So when you said that today, just now, it took all of that back. Like it was like, whoa. So yeah, you <laughs> it's kind of interesting how that works. Well listen. Uh, the yeah. most the most interesting thing to me is when you create that emotion, you do it in a way that makes the other person think about themselves, not think about you. Right. Like I took you back to your neighborhood. Maybe you're riding a bike, maybe it's the winter time, maybe you're skiing, maybe you're ice skating. Whatever you're doing, yep. I put you back there. And you're going to listen to the next thing that I say, and then the next thing that I say, and then the next thing that I say, because I promise you, by the end of that conversation, we will have a lot, not just common ground, mutual interests. Right. And the mutual interest is where it's going to be. So if I tell you that, um, and I don't know how well you know Salt Lake City, but I'm, I'm pals with Mark Eaton. You know Mark Eaton? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great guy. No, amazing guy. Yeah, he really is. And uh, now that we both know Mark Eaton, we've, we, we now have another bond. Yeah. We both know Mark Eaton's a great guy. He's been here several times. Uh, we've palled around in other cities when he'd given a speech. Um, he came to one of my book launches just for the hell of it. He's a good guy. Yeah. His speech, you should hire him to do it. Yeah, he's I, good. He's very good. We and actually one of his teammates, Thrill Bailey. I don't know if you ever met Thrill Bailey, but uh, he's he's the same kind of caliber of a human. Just yeah. incredible. But Mark Eaton's speech is now a ten, not a nine. It's a ten. Yeah. And when he talks about team, that's everything you deal with. Anything having to do with with the uh, with the relationship marketing involves team. It does. And he, the way he talks about it is mesmerizing because there's a kid who didn't play basketball until he was 21 years old. It's amazing. It's I mean, amazing. it's a story and a half. So to all of our listeners, we're listening to Jeffrey Gittimer, the king of sales, been around for many, many years, written the book. Uh, wait a minute. Wait, wait a second. Selling. I'm not ending. I'm not ending. I'm just kind of. No, 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 no. I don't. Many, many years. I'm like, a, like I'm decrepit. Yeah. Hey, listen, we're old, dude. We're old. You and I are old as dirt. Let's just let's face it. It's it's, it's okay. We're, I'm actually old and dirt. Heart, yeah, you know, I've dirt old. around here. That's like sixty years old. I'm way older than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, you've been involved with the Napoleon Hill Foundation, and I really yep. want, I want to learn a little bit more. I'm a huge fan of Napoleon Hill. A huge fan of personal development, self help. Napoleon Hill's writings uh, were one of my first exposures to the personal development world when I was just a kid. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you're doing there. I met Don Green, who is the president and the, I guess the chief executive founder of the Napoleon Hill Foundation. I was introduced to him by Charlie Tremendous Jones about 15 years ago. And we were talking and I, I asked him, I said, does the Napoleon Hill Foundation have a newsletter? And he said, no, we don't. I said, well, I'm willing to do it on one condition. And he said, what's that? I said, did you pay me a dime? And it's like, you make a statement like that. And the other person is immediately taken aback because everyone approaches that guy and says, well, I can make you a lot of money. All you have to do is give me your mailing list and da 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 Okay, so for 12 years, I've done that for free every Friday. Never missed an issue. Built them thousands and thousands of people on a mailing list, all, all gratis because Napoleon Hill gave me my positive attitude. Yeah. I mean, how do you pay back somebody for that? So I've been doing that for a long time. Well, 
we developed a friendship. He, Don Green, uh, many of the people from the organization, been to my home. What can we do together? How can we do something? So he, he finds the first writings of Napoleon Hill in a box and called me on the phone and said, hey, would you like to edit and annotate this stuff? And I go, sure. And so we formed a partnership to this book called Truthful Living, which was written by Napoleon Hill in 1917, 20 years before Think and Grow Rich. Wow. And it is full of absolute gems. So if you're listening and you need something new to be able to kick your butt, go get Truthful Living. It will help you. So you can just get that on Amazon, right? Yeah. Uh, just put a link in there. Put a link in the show notes. So I want to make sure our listeners heard that. Truthful Living, the first writings of Napoleon Hill. Uh, go to Amazon to pick that up. Um, yeah, and, and incredible stuff. So it's cool that you get involved with those kind of things. You know, again, you've, you've, you've been a coach of, of sales and you're known the king of sales, but you're a big person. Oh, yeah. Guy. Oh, yeah. A lot of you are... Yeah. So, and I'm the same way, you know, I've, I've, uh, I'm very known as a relationship marketing guy, but I also do seminars on personal development and different things. Cause the most important relationship that you can ever build is with yourself. And I really believe that. In fact, in my book, I have a book, uh, power of human connections. It's about relationship marketing. There's 12 chapters are all on the subject of relationship marketing through the sales channel and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But the last five chapters are all focused on building relationship with self, and they're all personal development oriented. How do you nourish the soul? How do you nourish yourself? You know, one of the things we teach is that what, what you want to do, my mom, my mom would tell me this all the time when I was a kid, and I've implemented this as a principle of teaching throughout all my courses. My mom used to always say to me, Cody, your first, she was she was a good mother. She would plant seeds for her son, and, she, and the seeds she'd plant in my mind, and she would say, "Cody, you're a special boy. You're meant to do something special in the world." She would say that to me all the time when I was a kid, but it's what she followed it up with that may, had the biggest impact. What she said was, "As long this is what this is what I need you to remember, son. Find out who you are." and give yourself away to other people. If you'll do that, you'll make a huge impact in the world. So I've been teaching that ever since. Find out who you are, mm -hmm. the best version. Not, not, don't just give you away, give the best version of you away to other people. I know that you talk a lot about that kind of thing. Um, so just share with us the importance of nourishing your personal self and how important that is in the sales process. In the little gold book of yesterday, attitude I proclaim in order for you to be the best person for other people you must be the best person you can be for yourself first if you want to be the best dad first you have to be the best person if you want to be the best mom if you want to be the best salesperson if you want to be the best teacher if you want to be the best doctor first you got to be the best person once you become the best person for yourself when you go in the bathroom mirror in the morning and instead of looking there and just kind of grumbling, you look at there and you go, Woo, look at that, come on. If you can do that in the morning, you're starting your way to a happy day. You have a choice every single day. You wake up in the morning and you have a choice. Gonna be a great day, gonna be a crappy day, or gonna be a meh, meh, meh day. I'm, I have a great day every day. That's my personal choice. Right. I wake up happy. Now I've only been waking up happy since 1972. So I don't know. And I remember I grew up in New Jersey where no one's happy. <laughs> right, right. I used to live in New Jersey. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Exactly. And I, 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 like to, I tell people in Charlotte, they go, what's the difference between living in New Jersey and living in Charlotte? I say, well, in Charlotte, when they wave at you, they use all their fingers. <laughs> That's the easiest way to discern the difference. But this is a bigger challenge, Cody. And this is a, this is a huge one. I'm making certain that I give my best because I feel my best. And what happens, and this is over an extended period of time, and this is how successful people literally keep their shit together, you have to renew yourself. Because if you don't renew yourself, you get fat, you get lazy, you get complacent, you get 
irritable, you become uh, almost cynical about life and things and people. And that's real easy to do if you live in the Northeast where everyone is cynical. Right. So I've lived in Charlotte for the last 30 years by the grace of God. Literally, I don't know how I got here. I just showed up one day. Oh, this is where I'm going to live. Because it felt like home. And it is home. I can go back to Philly anytime and love the atmosphere, love what I've learned, but you can't live there. <laughs> it's just, it's way too negative. And now when I go back to New York City, I can take it because I don't live there. I get to stay for a week or two and then get on a plane. Yeah. I'm going home. I don't, I, and I don't get upset by their crap. And I try to be friendly, but they won't take it. Yeah. Like I'll go into Starbucks and, and I'll say, uh, hey, how's it going? And the person goes, what do you want? Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, just. <laughs> you know, it's funny. When I, I used to, uh, I worked in New York City for a year and, you know, they, they taught you when you when you first started going to New York, uh, you can always tell a tourist in New York City. You can always tell a, a, a tourist because they're looking around. Right. Everything that's going on because there's always something going on on the street. Yep. Like crazy yep. stuff going on everywhere all, all the yep. time. So tourists are doing this. You can always tell a regular, you know, or, or somebody that's a native there works there because they know nothing, man. It's head down. It ain't only head down. It is walk. No fast. talking. No eye contact. No eye contact. Walk fast. Back to this day, that was thirty years ago that I that I uh, worked for an ad agency there, and today all of my people that work for me they they joke about me when we walk through airports. They can't keep up with me because I walk so fast. Like, how do you walk so fast? You're a short little guy. How do you walk so fast? I'm like, that's New York City, man. I learned how to walk. Exactly. Go walk fast in New York. They just run you right over. So there's something, there was something kind of exciting about that. You know, there's something kind of exciting about being in New York and there, there is an energy there, even though. Totally. Yeah. Totally. But there are people that refuse to go because right. they're afraid of it. Right. When in fact, it's the epicenter of our culture. Yeah, no question. I mean, you go to LA or San Francisco, there's no culture there anymore. Hey, you, you just coined a great title of a book. First, you got to be the best person. That'd be a good title of a book. You got to write that thing. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you don't, I might. You know, I mean, who well, I, We ought to do something do together. together. We'll do I mean, I don't want to make a marriage out of this, but we, we should do something together just because of our history of personal development and our belief in you, know, you become what you think about and, and to be the best person you can be for yourself. And love, I'd love to do a project with you. That would be cool. a dream come true. I think we could do some good stuff. You know? I agree. Yeah, I totally agree. So, Jeff, this is the, what we like to do at the close of all of our shows is I'd like to just give you the floor. You know, I've been asking questions and you've been kind of uh, caged a little bit into my line of questioning. And now I'm going to free it up. I'm going to free it up. So I'm just going to give you the floor. Uh, just tell my audience what they need to hear from the one and only Jeffrey Gidmore. Go ahead. Close Thanks. out. Number one, and I'm writing about this as we speak, if you don't love what you do, stop doing it. Life is way too short for you to go to work every day and grumble, because then you're going to go home and grumble, you're going to drink a beer, you're going to watch Netflix, and you're going to be pissed off at everything and everyone. If you go to work and do something you love, like even if it's playing golf or playing baseball, if you love to do it, automatically you'll become great at it and automatically you'll start to earn money as a result of it. Think of some place, if you want to find out where, where, well, what do I love to do? Where would you work for free? Where would you go to work for nothing and hope that after a few months they start to pay you or a few weeks they start to pay you? And if you can do that, then you've found the place where you love and you, you, the calling that you have. You have to find your inner voice. You have to find what you love to do. And then you got to go do it. And a lot of people feel like they're stuck because they got kids and they got a mortgage payment and they got a car payment and they want to take a vacation. Dude, figure out, it's not a side hustle. It's a side love. If you can do what you love on the side and, and let it blossom on its own, you'll know when it's time to take the leap. It's not a leap of faith. It's a, it's a leap of preparedness. Yeah. And, and my feeling about that is that we're living in a society where there's too much negative crap going on. 
We're too divided. We're too, we're too alienated by this person thinks this way and this person thinks that way. Just think about yourself and think about the people you love and go do something that you love and you will win. And if you don't, you're going to grumble your way all the way to mediocrity. You will go poor, but you'll be mediocre. And no one, you know, well, I'm going to be the most mediocre person I possibly can be. No, no, dude, that's not where you go. Right. You go to be the best you possibly can be for yourself. It is selfish. I don't want to hear somebody say, I'll give you the best years of my life. Like, those were the best years. You don't give those away. You keep them for yourself. But you build yourself to where you can do the best you can do for others. You be the best you can be for others because you are the best you can be for yourself first. Wow. There you have it, my friends. Jeffrey Gittimer, the one and only, uh, the king of sales. By the way, you've got a, you've got a podcast. The I do. Podcast, uh, You're coming it? on it. It's called wow. Sell or Die. Sell or Die. Uh, and you co-host that with your new wife. Yeah, Jennifer Gluckow. She's going to change her name to Gittimer, but she hasn't done it officially yet. Yeah, um, so you recently got married. In fact, Jennifer yeah. was uh, on my show recently. She did a fantastic uh, job. Sells yep. in the New York Minute. Uh, tell you what, she's, she's brilliant. She's brilliant. I mean, I really applauded her a lot on the show. Just her branding, the, the way she's branding her, yep. stuff, her message is just phenomenal. And so it's just, just hats off and bundle of energy. My gosh, it's yep. you young. She's going to keep you young, man. She's I will tell you what, I, I, I will admit it that I'm a great salesperson. Just look at my wife. Yeah, no question about it. Yeah, she's a true true lady uh a true uh, incredible contribution to our profession and uh, really appreciate both of you and look forward to working with you here in the near future call cool. me too cody there you have it my friends jeffrey gittimer thank you very much for being on with us uh, all of you just a quick reminder uh make sure that you check out the relationship marketing grand summit coming up in salt lake city www.rmgs.com check it out come on out and see us we're going to and have a great time. Jeffrey, we're going to get you on our stage here soon, and it's going to be an honor to have you It'll with us. It's going to be a pleasure. I'll talk to you soon, Cody. All Cheers, right. bye. Take care, everybody. If you have enjoyed this episode of the Relationship Marketing Podcast with Cody B, be sure to subscribe to the show and leave a review so that together we can get this message, The Power of Human Connection, out to the world. You can find Cody's new book, The Power of Human Connection, on Amazon or the Send Out Cards gift store.